Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Federation of Engineer Institutions of Asia and Pacific Youth Talent Development Working Groups 2021 Meet and Greet Accomplished Engineers Series number four. My name is Richard Mo. I am the co-founder of FIAP's uh, YTDWG and is currently the chair of the Young Engineer Alliance Committee of the Chinese Institute of Engineers in Taiwan. And I am also the chairman of the MA Group Consulting Engineers Taiwan Company, a 46-year-old multidisciplinary consulting firm. Uh, today, I'm very, very honored to be, uh, to be here to uh, interview a very special guest, Taiwan's first digital minister, Ms. Audrey Tang. Uh, thank you, Minister, minister Tang, Audrey, for your kind acceptance to our meet and greet program, despite your very, very busy schedule. Uh, before I begin, uh, allow me to give a few minutes of housework reminders. Uh, today, we have over 140 registered engineers listening online. Uh, we are also on the live stream via the YouTube and LinkedIn. Uh, we have uh, participants from 14 economies, Australia, China, France, Hungary, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Myanmar, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, and the USA. And the age span from 20 years old to over 70 years old. Uh, the participants include students uh, to engineers, senior engineers, and a very experienced uh, advisors of various pro uh, engineering professions, including those in the industry, uh, school professors, uh, managers, researchers, and officers in various government entities. Uh, the session will last around one hour. And, uh, and to, for the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, put in the questions in the Q&A section. We will aim to answer some of the questions in the last 15 to 25 minutes. So before I begin, let me allow me to uh, introduce Audrey. Uh, Audrey is known as one of the top 10 computing personalities of Taiwan. She was a child prodigy, being able to read classical literature before five years old, programming by eight, and coding in the pro computer language by 12. She started her own business at 15, and worked in the Silicon Valley at uh, 19. She worked for Apple as a consultant for computational linguistics, and she took the role of the digital minister in 2016. And since then has brought many positive impacts uh, through the use of digital technologies and social innovations, including the effective solutions to combat COVID-19 when it first hit Taiwan in 2020. She's also an advocate to the United Nations 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And in this dialogue, we will be hearing about her recent innovations, her outlooks on how digitalization can play a key role in the UN's uh, 17 SDG goals, and how digitalization can be in, uh, used in traditional engineering industries. And also her views on the critical skills and mindsets that future engineers need to address the many, many challenges that we face today. Okay, without further ado, uh, we will start now with uh, some questions and we welcome uh, Minister Audrey Tang. Hello, good local time, everyone. Really happy to be here, well, virtually. Yeah, thank you, Audrey. Uh, uh, thank you for your precious time. Uh, I understand that upon taking the position of Taiwan's first digital minister, you have brought to the society very important concepts including the digital social innovation uh, based on three elements of fast, fair, and fun. And I'm sure today you have also uh, carried out many new uh, projects. Could you share some of the latest digital innovation projects with us? Certainly. Um, one of the ongoing challenge in the past couple of years is how to counter this pandemic, which we successfully did in Taiwan so far with no lockdown, uh, and counter the associated infodemic, that's the disinformation crisis, with no takedown. So uh, to counter the pandemic with no lockdown means that we need to help the contact tracers to do their job. So one of the more recent inventions, digital social innovations in Taiwan, one uh, is the so-called SMS-based check-in system. Uh, the idea, very simply put, 
is that any venue, any small shop or whatever, can very easily print a QR code. But instead of requiring a specific app, you don't have to install anything. Just on the uh, lock screen of the iPhone or Android, just scan it, and uh, it will pop a SMS message, which contains a randomized location code, and just hit send. And that's just like two seconds. And everyone can uh, complete this very quickly without leaving any uh, privacy related details at the venue. So we've got a lot of adoption and we think the um, five major telecoms to act as data controllers so that they will uh, store it just for 28 days uh, before rotating it out. Now, this uh, is traditionally called this multi-party uh, design. Previously, people would uh, really not uh, prefer to have the uh, contact tracing to be aggregated in a single uh, store. But nowadays, uh, people can either trust the venue or they can trust their own telecom and no party has the uh, specific uh, whereabouts of any particular person. And this checking can only be used for contact tracing purposes. And it has drastically reduced the work for contact tracers. Previously, they have to spend days uh, to get a complete history. But nowadays, it's usually completed within half a day. Okay, well, th thank you. The, those are uh, very revolutionary, um, inspiring concepts. Uh, what were the building blocks that allow you to think of new ideas to, and then how, how did you implement these ideas? In well, in a time? sense, it, right, it's, it's not my idea, right? It comes from this community called GovZero or g 0 V. Now, for all the government public service in Taiwan, it's usually uh, done in websites that ends in something that GOV, that TWS is other countries' websites. However, in Taiwan, there's a bunch of people, um, tens of thousands actually, <laughs> that looks to <clears throat> fork the government's pronunciation is very important, fork the government. Fork in software engineering means taking something uh, to a different direction while keeping its original functionality, but uh, develop it with a new imagination. And nowadays, also a soft fork uh, usually says, uh, okay, we also relinquish the copyrights so that the uh, upstream may choose to merge it back. So the idea is that GovZero look at all the digital services that Taiwanese government is not yet doing or isn't yet doing well, and then they invent better alternatives to that. So uh, last year, the mask rationing map was a prime example where people can, uh, as they're queuing uh, in the pharmacies, before going to the pharmacies, they can check their phone or chat bar or whatever to find a place that still have masks in stock. And the same bunch of people, the civic technologists, this year uh, co-developed this specification for SMS-based app-free contact tracing. And so what I did is like a reverse procurement. They did a standardization, and then I just made sure that we implemented it in an affordable way uh, through toll-free SMS. So when you tried to uh, implement these, what were the uh, biggest obstacles you had to overcome to, in order to implement yeah. these ideas? Certainly. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, the building block really is mutual trust, right? To give no trust is to get no trust. So we need to trust the citizens to first experiments uh, with Actually, last year, there was more than 100 different mask rationing uh, visualizations in bots and analysis and so on. Not all worked great, but a few worked really well. And then we sort of uh, soft standardized on those de facto um, implementations, which are then uh, adapted uh, in Korea and other countries as well uh, for visualizing the PPE supply. Now, this year also, uh, we've worked with not just uh, um, domestic um, apps that's produced produced by local municipalities and local uh, convenience chain stores and things like that, but also international uh, developers like Singapore actually had two iterations of a very similar idea. And then we learned from the success as well as shortcomings of each and every all of it, and we get the primary uh, um, architects uh, on the same Slack channel. Uh, and we did a very uh, quick brainstorm for a couple of days before settling on this new specification. So the main uh, building block is mutual trust. And the main shortcoming, if we're uh, getting into a place where the government just uh, hits on an idea and then say, OK, this is a national standard. Everybody else, stop uh, what, whatever you're doing. That will be a, a block, because uh, then the better idea would not have the chance uh, to prove itself to a smaller bunch of people. Hmm. Um, uh, maybe if I could go back to one step uh, uh, sure. ahead is, 
Could you explain what social innovation is and then sure. the concept of fast, fair, and fun? Sure. Social innovation means everyone's business with everyone's help. Mm -hmm. So it means that uh, it must be a social issue, right? Uh, something that affects all of us. And then it must be open innovation, meaning that uh, anyone who gets affected gets a say uh, in contributing to the innovation. So, for example, uh, the free software community, the open source movement is a kind of social innovation because anyone who use a piece of program is uh, empowered to fork, to change the direction of that program, uh, while, of course, not having any copyright or patent um, uh, lawsuits coming their way. Right. So that's one primary social innovation. Now, uh, Fosphere Fund refers uh, to the fact that on the dig uh, digital creation realm, everybody have plenty of issues, projects, and so on to, to work on. So how do you make sure that the digital social innovation that you're working on, for example, the mass rationing map, um, gets the contributors uh, that's required for a very quick brainstorming session and produce something uh, that is a viable prototype ready to be rolled out to the entire country, uh, 23 million people, within just three days. So first, the fast part. The collective intelligence need to act in a way that nobody need and anybody's approval uh, to run their small experiments to start their own prototypes and things like that. We need a forum like in Taiwan, the PTT serves like Reddit, but it's um, non for profits, right? It's also governed in a, a open way. So anyone who have a good idea can receive in real time the uploads and downloads there and so on. And then uh, whatever contributions that people make uh, need to prove that it's fair. That is to say, um, for example, we must not make uh, mask rationing uh, algorithms that overprivileged people in urban areas at the expense of uh, rural areas. We must not say that you have to learn to use a, a smartphone uh, to scan a QR code uh, for SMS-based checking, rather a feature phone, a flip phone. You can manually type that location code and send an SMS manually as well. So leaving no one out, leaving no one behind. That's the fairness part. And finally, really to complete such a check-in is a very uh, rewarding, gratifying even process because it's just so easy. Uh, if uh, this um, like uh, internet meme, right? If you get uh, this internet meme in a few seconds and then you click share, that's another few seconds. If it's less than 10 seconds, then people will just virally share it. The basic reproduction number, right? Uh, it will go viral uh, in a community. But if it requires like five minutes, 10 minutes to set up an app first, then of course that will not catch on because it's not fun at all. Mm. Wow. And so the, 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 what, what, what would be the um, foundation to allow social innovations, fun, fast, fair to work? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, two things. One is uh, broadband as a human rights. In Taiwan, even on the tip of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second for just 15 euros per month. Otherwise, it's my fault, like personally, my fault. Um, and so because of that, uh, we do not say that you have to obtain some expensive uh, connection, expensive equipment. Anyone who gets affected can just participate. And also, uh, there needs to be in basic education and lifelong education, an mm -hmm. emphasis on digital competence rather than just literacy. Because literacy is just about receiving right uh, reading a book or uh, watching a TV uh, show or whatever uh, and be able to comprehend it as literacy but uh, competence means that anyone needs to uh, have this um, empowerment that says okay if you don't like it well we'll go ahead and do a new version and uh, people would be equipped to not just download the messages but also participate in fact checking in measuring air quality contributing to climate science uh, and and all sorts of different ways to participate in the civic life, even before they turn 18. Wow. So uh, then uh, in terms of the digital competence, uh, right now we live in a world where there's five different generations. Mm -hmm. uh, people mm -hmm. uh, 70 years old during the you know, post-World War II, all the way that's to right. new, you know, right now young people. Mm -hmm. So how, how, that's a big gap. How, how would the, mm -hmm. uh, I think in Taiwan it's quite mm -hmm. well, implemented mm -hmm. in terms of the mm -hmm. computer company. Mm -hmm. but could you share with that some insights 
Yeah, definitely. So, for example, uh, when we uh, designed the way for people to ask the Central Epidemic Command Center, the CECC questions, uh, it's not just through the internet, it's not just through journalists and so on, uh, or live streams and so on, but also through a simple thing uh, called a toll-free landline number, 1922. So anyone can pick up their landline phone uh, or mobile phone and dial 1922 toll-free uh, and to, to speak their mind about the uh, counter epidemic approaches as well as make new suggestions and instead of going to voicemail or anything it's very um, people with with a lot of empathy uh, listening uh, to to these people the, there's more than two million calls uh, last year alone this year probably more uh, and uh, any new feedback even if it's from a very old person very senior person or a very young person like uh, I think there was a, a young middle schooler uh, called last April saying you're rationing our mask that's great but all I got was pink ones I don't want to wear it to school all the boys in my class have navy blue mask and the very next day everybody in the central epidemic Command Center press conference were pink, uh, mm -hmm. and Minister Chen even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. Uh, and so that means that the real time accountability can take place in not four year or two year iterations, but 24 hour iterations. And it's as simple as picking up the phone and call a toll free number in order to participate. So the, the execution of these ideas is not easy to, uh, especially to implement it so fast in such a mm -hmm. short period of time. Uh, could mm -hmm. you share with us the uh, the challenges of how you executed these ideas? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's actually very easy. Oh. If you uh, design the procurement contract such that instead of delivering one single service like filing the tax, uh, one needs to serve not just human beings, but also uh, what we call open API. It's a Linux foundation standard that says uh, if you build a website uh, or an app or something, uh, you cannot just build it for, for uh, human beings. If a robot want to read and write it through a JSON open API, you also need to provide that. Otherwise, you're uh, the vendor would be discriminating against robots and could be disqualified. Well, we don't quite say that, but that's a fact. But the, the point here is that we installed this open API based API first procurement back in 2016. And so we are now uh, benefiting. Uh, from the fruit of that contract because uh, when we redesigned the text filing service, uh, we did it in a way that's collaborative. Uh, it started by some uh, designer in our national petition platform saying the old text filing system is explosively hostile. And then we invite anyone who have a gripe with the text filing uh, system to co-create a new system. And because we designed a new system to be API based like Lego blocks, the participant to that collaborative meeting, including say the Ministry of of health and welfare, the Ministry of the Economy, and so on, when it's their turn to build such a nationwide system for mask rationing, for stimulus vouchers, for vaccine dispense uh, and pre-registration and so on, they can go back and say, let's just use this API uh, for, for example, SMS sending, let's use this API for authenticating, let's use this API for the pre-registration and so on, so that when we have a good design, like the SMS contact tracing from the GovZero community with the actual implementation is just like pulling a few libraries together, which could be completed within just three days. Wow. So, the, the, so do you have a big team of people to be helping you doing all this? Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, Gov Zero is tens of thousands of people. Yeah. So, uh, and and that includes um, the the like lead architects and designers of many domestic and also international uh, companies uh, who, in their spare time, contribute back to the society. So that is by by and large uh, where the ideas come from. Now, if you uh, watch international media, sometimes people say, "Oh, the mass creation in or whatever is Audrey's idea." None of this is my idea. This is all Gov Zero's idea, and I'm just there. Kind the liaison a bridge uh, into the uh, cabinet level um, like resources and so on. Mm. So bridging the different uh, resources and different uh, entities there's there's because everyone has a different way of thinking. So mm -hmm. what the, the, how, how do you you know uh, uh, overcome these different way of thinking uh, different mm -hmm. people have different way of thinking? Well uh, to be honest I, I think everyone probably agree that when tackling uh, a public issue, doing something for public purpose, we need to uh, feel safe. And we also need uh, efficacy. We need it to, to, be, to be fast. So swift and safe, <clears throat> these are the two main values 
I'm not sure about the fund. That's probably uh, values a few, <laughs> but, but, but SWIFT and SAFE, uh, these two are probably the most important. And um, too often uh, when we're stuck uh, with the old way business is usual of doing things, sometimes we make trade-offs, right? We do re, uh, redesign something, we move fast, and then we break things. So people feel less safe, uh, cybersecurity-wise or privacy-wise. Or uh, we uh, become very risk-averse and we design a lot of protection mechanisms, which make it not at all swift uh, and indeed burdened with bureaucracy. But with digital social innovation, as long as anyone can uh, propose something that is a little bit swifter and a little bit safer, that's like a Pareto improvement on the uh, status quo, then we just implement it, as I mentioned, 24 hours later. So because of that, each small step sounds uh, incremental, but uh, because it leaves everyone feeling safer and also the, everyone's burden reduced. So that leaves more time for people to brainstorm more designs and processes uh, that can help on this swift and safe approach. I often compare it with the German uh, highway system, the Autobahn, right? The faster you drive, the safer you are. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I, I move on to part of the questions about uh, your application to the United Nations uh, Sustainable sure. Development. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I see that a lot of these innovative concept behind it is to reach the sustainable developments of mm -hmm. our society. Uh, and I, uh, so to you, what is, how do you define the big words sustainable and mm -hmm. resilient? Mm -hmm. Sure. So sustainability mm -hmm. means prosper in this generation, but more uh, importantly, prosper with future generations. Mm -hmm. Or to reduce it even further, uh, to be sustainable is to be a good enough ancestor. Uh, and so this idea of good enough ancestorship means that, of course, we all do our part. We cannot design 100% perfectness. Uh, that will probably leave no room for uh, creativity for future generations. But on the other hand, we cannot uh, pollute the environment or destroy social trust and so on to a point where it's impossible for future generations uh, to improve upon the current uh, condition to, to uh, take opportunities away from them, right? So to prosper uh, in a way that's uh, intergenerational, I, I believe, is the point of sustainability. And it also means that when this generation is faced uh, with some natural disasters or with something that um, adversarial effects of many of our own creations, um, then we, we cannot just say, oh, c'est la vie, uh, la, la, the next generation will figure it out. We need to build back better in this current generation so that the next generation stands a fair chance to realize whatever that they want to optimize in their generation. Yeah. Then, then, so how would uh, digitalization play a role? Well, I think you mentioned before social innovation, mm -hmm. all those yes. examples, but are mm -hmm. there any further roles of how digitalization can, be, mm -hmm. can play yes. a role? Yeah. So without digitalization, uh, we naturally only care about our physical neighbors. It's very easy to design systems that makes ourselves and our neighbors happy while creating a lot of negative externalities, pollutions and so on on somewhere else in the planet because without digitalization, we're not aware of it we, or we choose not to be aware of it. But with the digitalization, as we can see nowadays for counter pandemic, the entire world is a community. I often wake up uh, to um, my Canadian or South American counterparts um, during the day, of course, with people in Asia and closer to the evening with people in Africa and Europe and so on. But everyone has the same urgency. When I talk about vaccination, PPEs, contact tracing, and things like that, we're facing this issue together. So we feel much closer to each other. And the internet indeed was built for this, right? Mm -hmm. Was built for when it's uh, almost impossible to travel physically after a uh, nuclear war or something. That's the <laughs> initial brief. So we're now in a place where the internet was built for this kind of global neighborhood in a, a situation where movement is restricted. Without the internet, the access to this kind of the social innovation would become almost impossible during the time of pandemic. Mm. That, that how would uh, certain uh, industries, that's uh, traditional industry, mm -hmm. they move very mm -hmm. slow, they, mm -hmm. they change very slow, but digitalization mm -hmm. is a tool or a uh, way of change that's very fast. So these mm -hmm. two ideas kind of clash against each other. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you see the uh, mm -hmm. how traditional industries, such mm -hmm. as 
civil engineering. Well, I, I, I'm in public service. It's also a very old industry. <laughs> well, we're in a service industry, I guess, <laughs> public service. But anyway, the, the point here is that uh, when we're innovating, we're not throwing out the old. We're not challenging uh, the, the old. We're, we're simply saying there may exist ways that will realize our original values, but uh, in a more swift and safe fashion. This is all what we're saying, right? So for example, uh, as I become the digital minister, I make sure that anyone with more than 5,000 petitions, uh, counter signatures online can mm -hmm. surface their newest ideas uh, mm -hmm. to the cabinet level. And we can then work on cross-ministerial conversations and so on. So uh, for example, there was a case where we talk about the e-sport uh, and the Ministry of Culture was saying, okay, um, you know, e-sport doesn't have a, a traditional heritage. So it's probably uh, the, uh, the the idea of sport ministry. And the sport agency says, uh, well, it doesn't move the, the entire body. So it's not a sport to us. It's probably the Ministry of Economy. And the economy says, uh, well, uh, we, we work on the physical equipment for e-sport, but the individual athletes, uh, probably not our business either. And that shows the kind of old, more conservative uh, pace that they are thinking about that you just outline in any traditional industry there's a certain pattern of thinking but uh, with the help of digital social innovation and specifically with people on PTT um, because I post the entire transcript online for people to review and annotate so there are people on PTT uh, on our equivalent reddit that says oh but do you know uh, Go Weiqi the, the AlphaGo that uh, board game is now an uh, esport. Computer plays it better. People play it online and things like that. So whatever uh, we designed for bridge players and go players and so on can be adapted <clears throat> for esport players without changing the existing law or regulations. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, digital is about connecting people with people. It's not about replacing people with machines. As long as the Ministry of Culture, Economy, as well as the existing legislators all can see that there exists values are being respected they're not uh they're not shying away from a reinterpreting to say okay now uh, go is a esport and we are now including more real-time esports into our original um implementations so this is about connecting it's not about tearing something down mm. so uh how how would uh because right now there's a lot of uh severe climate changes Mm -hmm. causing a lot of natural disasters yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. digitalization innovations are often used to support the natural mm -hmm. disasters uh, preventions or mitigation. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, are there any new idea or new ways that's uh, yeah. uh, right now that you may know of that should mm -hmm. be used further? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, so we run a annual presidential hackathon uh, every year uh, and the top teams become our national level policies. Mm -hmm. And so this year, the international track is all about climate action. And last year, even the domestic track, I think the five champions all have something to do uh, mm -hmm. with climate action. So without the time to go into details, uh, it includes, for example, an augmented reality tool that can um, have people um, plant, plant the planting. Uh, and have the future trees speak to them and commit uh, for, for the local community to commit uh, to the maintenance of the trees and so on. And that's uh, aggregated become a kind of popular will uh, to plant the trees. Or there was an app uh, that can use push a notification uh, that tells you uh, whether the climate is heating and uh, probably you need to drink more. And the same app also displays the uh, local like water stations so that you can walk into those stations and get a free refill of water while saving on the plastic and thereby also reduce carbon footprint and also learn something about local histories and so on. There's uh, new ideas about the use of smart meter uh, to uh, inform better uh, the use of electronic appliances in people's homes so it doesn't uh, have to wait for like 10 years or 20 years uh, to, to gain back uh, on the electricity bills but can uh, just very easily use machine learning to analyze the, the usage patterns so that people can plan a entire industry or just your home better when it comes to the energy use and so on. So uh, I think all of these qualifies as social innovation because everyone can also contribute to make it slightly better. Mm, wow. wow, that's a lot of information to, to mm -hmm. dive uh, Could you also share with us, um, again, I, I mentioned before the, 
right now we live in an era of five different generations. Mm -hmm. And uh, for myself, I grew up uh, during this time when there's no internet to mm -hmm. a lot of computer evolution, uh, you know, all kinds of computer uh, mm -hmm. to internet worldwide wide during college. And then mm -hmm. now to mobile phones and now mm -hmm. even more ways of using digital. So yep. each generation has a different way of thinking and each mm -hmm. generation has their own merits and mm -hmm. wisdom. How, how do we facilitate the, the, the understanding of different generations to other generations? Mm -hmm. This will smooth out a lot of communication and be able to implement projects better or mm -hmm. ideas better. I think one of the keys uh, of doing intergenerational innovation is that instead of identifying, uh, I, I know some people identify with, I don't know, Gen X, Gen Z or, or whatever, uh, but instead of identifying with anything, focus on the common experiences, right? Uh, right. For example, I, I never say I identify as this gender or the next. I say I experience one puberty and then I experience another puberty. And so it's basically uh, the same history, but narrative in a way that maximizes the commonality right between different people so for example um the the popular mobile game pokemon go when it was first released we see a lot of grandparents uh and with their uh younger grandchildren and uh they're just catching some pocket monsters, I guess, but both sides have something to, to relate to, right? The older generation can uh, share, uh, like you can catch this kind of fish here because it used to be a lake here. And, and so on the local histories and the younger generations can well relate about the uh, ACG worldview and things like that. So, so, but this is something genuinely new for both generations and they can co-create. I think we need to choose the topics that focus on the common values and then engage the senior people as early as possible. Mm. Okay, uh, that's great. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, could you also uh, share with us that um, in today's world, uh, everything's interconnected. So cross disciplinaries, uh, each person will probably need multiple types of skills and a more global attitude and more sensitive mm -hmm. attitude to the sustainable environment. So mm -hmm. um, how, what are the skills and mindset that you feel that younger generations or people in college need to equip themselves to tackle the so many challenges that we're facing now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I do believe that the key idea of competence, that is to say you can make some contributions and uh, be, be introduced to the community by your contributions. And it's not just your own duty, but everyone can just make a little bit of contribution so that it adds better, it adds together better. This, I think, is very important because the uh, old way of education in most of East Asia, and certainly Taiwan when I was a kid, uh, focused a lot on the individual to individual competition uh, within the class or within the school and so on. Uh, but uh, truth to be told, no large scale issues and indeed none of the sustainable goal targets can be tackled by a single person alone. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, if it's this uh, simple to solve, it'll probably Probably will be solved and not be made into a global goal, right? So, uh, in to tackle those global goals, we need to work across. Uh, generations across cultural boundaries, across disciplines, and so on. And the first thing to to say is not, okay, I, I'm better than you on some discipline, or I'm scored better, uh, I'm an A, I usually scored a B, or something like that, but rather, uh, what can you bring to the table? Uh, what can you contribute through your uh, unique uh, perspective, through your life experience, and so on? Uh, what can you contribute to this common value and what innovations can you bring to the table uh, that delivers on those common values? And we keep uh, asking those two questions, how to uh, get to our common values first, and then how to innovate to deliver on those values uh, without leaving anyone behind. If we keep asking those two questions, that's the path of building competence. Mm, wow. So so, then, so a lot of these is start to need to start to build up since um, since elementary school, middle school. That's school. right. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, for uh, right now, because of the technological advancement, there's a huge migration of engineering graduates moving away from the traditional industry to these new fields of uh, IT or semiconductor, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 we feel that sometimes there is an imbalance of the engineering capacity. 
Yeah, so uh, from your viewpoint, how do we motivate engineers to continue to stay in their traditional industries? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in Taiwan, we have this saying of uh, a xie gang or a slash, right? Mm -hmm. So one can be a uh, engineer slash designer. Uh, or a um, designer slash poet, poet slash politician, making it a poetician. But anyway, the, the point is that, yeah. as I just mentioned, instead of identifying with one single role or one simple discipline, uh, instead think of ourselves as someone who can contribute with this experience and with that experience. Because experience are inclusive. If we experience the design worlds better, for example, then we start to see that the community communication skill that's required is actually cross-disciplinary. Um, instead of just staying in any particular industry, the kind of design thinking can be taken to any particular industry and then connect it with other industries in other sectors. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that, of course, it's great to be uh, a well-trained uh, engineer in a particular field, but do not let that limit you to not learn about design, to learn about specifically interaction design and service design, which is uh, widely applicable across industries. And you can then serve as the bridge to connect the old and the new industries together. Mm. So what, what, what kind of uh, ways are there? Sometimes I also think about this question is how do we encourage people to think beyond what they were taught? Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Being in school or being in one profession for too long, your whole mindset is locked in, into that. Thing. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we we try to find ways to let them break, you know, think out of the box. Mm -hmm. What 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 from your experience? What kind of methods? Mm -hmm. are yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, my own uh, office HR policy is that we invite one secondment from each ministry, but not more. So to maximize the diversity and inclusion of the office. And when we're holding collaborative meetings on the tax uh, filing experience redesign, instead of holding the uh, group discussions uh, from the Ministry of Finance participation offices, we deliberately invite, say, the um, uh, sea Patrol, the Ocean Patrol, uh, or uh, the Ministry of Interior, or the National Palace Museum uh, to hold such discussions. But when it's time to talk about the ocean policy, then maybe it's the Ministry of Finance holding the, the group. Uh, and this is not just a gimmick. This, this is something very deep because they are all career public servants, very professional. But yeah. too often they take only the position of that of a rule maker and policy maker. But when a um, Ocean Affairs Council officer takes the group discussion lead on tax filing design, they necessarily take the position of a tax filing citizen. Right. They would take the citizen side because they have nothing to do with the finance ministry and the finance ministry public servant. If you assign them the job of holding the group discussion for the ocean uh, affairs, redesign of ocean services, surfing and things like that, then they take the uh, position of a surfer certainly, and not a, a ocean patrol, right? So um, to, uh, in an organization, design cross-functional teams and rotate uh, the chair and facilitating positions so that it's the person who are way outside of their comfort zone, but still cherished for their professionality. And then very quickly, they can build cross-functional teams by themselves. Mm, well, well, and I also understand, uh, Audrey, you actually uh, spend time going around the, the, the island to different right. parts of yes. the country to look mm -hmm. at and hear uh, mm -hmm. people's voice or people's mm -hmm. uh, ideas. So, Multiple islands have been to Jinmen also, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All, all the way to Jinmen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So, so those, um, mm -hmm. uh, could you give me, uh, give us, share an example where you, you heard a idea from the local people and you mm -hmm. went mm -hmm. to the policy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, and a, a lot of very good examples. Um, I remember, for example, uh, going to, to Hengchun, uh, which is the, the southmost, almost the southmost part of, of Taiwan. Uh, and at, at, that, at that place, they were uh, petitioning for the helicopters, the Black, Black Hawk helicopters uh, from the Ministry of Interior uh, to be uh, posted there uh, to serve as ambulance cars. And once we uh, listen to them, we start to understand
percent that they uh, when when they have people who are hurt from injuries and so on, uh, they almost always send northward to Kaohsiung and so on. Uh, but so they want a, a faster vehicle. Now, the great thing about getting all the different ministries, participation offices to join us in a discussion also remotely from uh, connecting from Taipei and other municipality is that people start to think out of the box. Instead of comparing the speed of a helicopter to that of an ambulance car, people start to focus on, so why would the professional surgeons not choose to operate in Hongchun? What's preventing them? Why are the professional nurses uh, not able to raise their family and stay in Hengchun and so on? So we get into the deeper questions and then we start to realize that uh, this is a kind of um, self-perpetuating uh, situation because the more people send their injured loved ones northward to Kaohsiung, the less they trust the local clinic and the local surgeons. And then the less trusted they are, the less likely they will stay for long uh, in Hengchun. So to break the cycle, we need to innovate digitally right we need to for example work on telemedicine we can get the surgeons uh, to remotely train the local surgeons through telepresence uh, even operate uh, locally uh, through telemedicine uh, and that will require then a uh, very good investment on either 5g or good fiber optic communication we need to work on redesigning the ambulance uh, so that uh, it gets the diagnostics or even some preliminary treatment while they're still on the ambulance and so on and all this is much better um, cost effective uh, then sending Blackhawks to this particular uh, town uh, for uh, ambulance purposes. So again, cross-functional teams works best if they're faced with a real issue with urgency and can engage directly with local people's needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how do you um, uh, pursue your dreams, like mm -hmm. your, your inspirations? Or uh, uh, Each person often have time, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes have a dream to they mm -hmm. want to do something. But mm -hmm. due to real world after graduation, mm -hmm. you have to go mm -hmm. to career uh, to work, etc. But how, how did you move away from that mm -hmm. to pursue your passion? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I pursue my dreams by going to sleep. I sleep for, for eight hours a day. That's yeah. that's my work time, really. So during daytime, I'm really just having fun and also uh, getting ideas from the entire uh, society and, and the world. But I don't pass judgments and I don't do my main work uh, while I'm awake. Instead, I just read everything and uh, uh, take all the sides in and then just go to sleep. And after eight hours, almost always wake up with something that is good enough that uh, people can live with. And then I, I start to work on that. So in a sense, I don't have anything uh, like my personal aspiration. Instead, during the day, whatever aspirations that may uh, be in tension or conflict with each other, uh, I receive with no uh, personal judgment, but I go to sleep. And if um, there's a, a lot of uh, stakeholders, a lot of stakeholders like the Hong Chun case or the East Park case, then I work over time. I'll sleep for uh, nine hours before waking up with a solution. To get more inspiration. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, uh, to jump into another question. How does uh, how do you view COVID-19 mm -hmm. impact how the mm -hmm. people will be working or interacting? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, 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 the pandemic is going to take some time before it, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it, there's going to be a new world. How, how do you yeah. see people? Mm -hmm. Interactive. Yeah, well, one thing is this global neighborhood thing, right? We, we stop defining our neighborhood as something physical. Nowadays, uh, anyone who are time traveler or at least time zone travelers uh, can connect to multiple communities across the world uh, and limited only by broadband accessibility, as I mentioned. So it means that uh, as long as we have pretty good internet connection cameras and such, uh, there's no real uh, difference between what's previously thought as the intranet or the extranet, right? Nowadays, it's all part of the internet that can form such ad hoc groups that work on the common standards and tackling common uh, issues and so on. And previously, it's very difficult to get this kind of uh, truly global teams because each population have different urgency assigned to different global issues. For example, uh, climate action, uh, it used to be that uh, on smaller islands, people feel more urgent and on larger continents, people feel less urgent. Uh, of course, nowadays, the urgency is more shared, 
bit, but it's also because we have success experiences working on a truly globally urgent issue that's the pandemic together. And then we take that successful collaboration model and apply it to climate action, to countering disinformation, uh, to other um, issues that would not uh, be able to do in a way that if people are siloed within their own jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, the time passes very quickly. So mm -hmm. um, maybe the last questions that I have is, is mm -hmm. that uh, what would be one word or one phrase you would mm -hmm. give to young engineers who will become the future leaders of our societies? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so just, just one word, <laughs> then if that's one word, then it's just uh, to listen. Uh, but if I am allowed more words, yes. uh, then yes. that's uh, also take all the sides while listening. So I'm not just talking about uh, listening to uh, obediently to an authority. Uh, that's not listening really, that's just obeying orders, but rather to listen carefully and deeply so that you can take the other person's side while holding, of course, your original positions and values and as you expand your ability to do that and truly taking in all the sides, then you start to see that uh, what superficially look like zero sum games can be transformed into positive sum games through open innovation. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for all the many, many uh, concepts and many ideas, uh, information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. listening is a big uh, skill and a lot mm -hmm. of, everyone needs to train more on the, the way to listen. Yeah, uh, right. I think uh, if, if okay, we will open the floor for a question or two. Uh, sure. Anyone from the, the yeah. There's mm -hmm. one uh, question is that uh, what kind of activities you, 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 you may feel that the uh, uh, FIAC mm -hmm. is the Federation of Engineer Institutes of Asia Pacific with 22 member uh, economies. Uh, uh, there's a new platform for young engineers. So what kind mm -hmm. of uh, activities could be possible to nurture these interactions between mm -hmm. young engineers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think the question was, was directed to you, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so maybe you, you can you can share your thoughts as well, uh, because I, I don't I don't really um, I, I don't really have an idea of what kind of common urgency that everyone feels, because the entire idea of social innovation builds upon common urgency, then common values, and then open innovations. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know what uh, are you counting as urgent in FEIAP. Yeah, actually, uh, there, there is uh, just to share with Audrey, we, we were thinking about a also a competition that's very mm -hmm. similar to what you mentioned about the presidential hackers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a competition to get ideas from the normal people on mm -hmm. the topic of sustainable development goals. Ah, okay. so some of those ideas come from the you know the 14 year old, sure. but they sure. just don't have the voice or the platform where this idea oh. can be mm -hmm. realized. So that's something yeah. that the FIAP uh, Youth Talent Development mm -hmm. Working Group will be working on. And mm -hmm. I think we will, uh, if there's a chance, mm -hmm. we'll reach out to Audrey to, to give us mm -hmm. some advices too. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's not just listening, but listening at scale. Uh, and, I and like scale. That. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. From all kinds of people. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there anyone from the audience that may have another question? Uh, uh, yeah, there's one question from the uh, audience. Uh, hi, Audrey. Thank you for your valuable insights. I would love to get your perspective on mm -hmm. printo currency, blockchain mm -hmm. technology, where the new economy is going, and mm -hmm. how we can be active participants of creating the new economy that benefits mm -hmm. everyone and leaves no one behind. Mm -hmm. The common values that you mentioned. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I work quite closely uh, with the crypto community, in particular with Ethereum, uh, because uh, in Presidential Hackathon, for example, and the Presidential Culture Award, uh, the voting system, quadratic voting, uh, was first prototype and designed on Ethereum. Uh, and we're learning from many other innovations there, quadratic funding and so on, uh, that we can look at Ethereum as kind of a small jurisdiction that moves very fast. Uh, and then uh, we take some of those public governance ideas and apply to our uh, jurisdiction. So their research or development. Um, and, and so I, I do believe that in the crypto space, uh, far more than just uh, pro providing a way to store value, it's also a way for people to experiment 
experiment with new ways of governance, of collaborative governance. And this goes beyond the voting or funding systems. We can uh, already see that new forms of democracy are being created. And because anyone can fork a chain, uh, very blockchain very easily. So uh, at any given time, there's like thousands of different governance methods uh, being experimented on. And because the total attention of the uh, developers uh, engagement is uh, bounded. So that means through kind of evolution, through kind of swarm application, after a while, we start to see the clear ideas emerge as better governance methods. And that include not causing a lot of carbon emissions uh, running that blockchain and so on, uh, the, the energy transition sustainable transitions and so on so, so all of that i think uh serve as great inspirations for us uh working in the public service to look uh, into those new innovations and that also uh, help us to see democracy as a kind of social technology. A lot of people, uh, especially in older uh, democracies and republics, are already think that that's just exactly the, the way it was. Uh, but uh, democracy is a technology. Instead of just being constrained to you know uploading uh, five bits every person every four years, which is called voting, uh, we can improve the bit rates of democracy through these ongoing continuous democracy including presidential hackathon sandbox petition and so on and all of it has its counterparts or prototype in the internet governance community including the crypto space okay thank you uh, another question is uh, do you think pandemics would trigger the trans uh, trigger transformation into vr and ar Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I do believe that shared reality is uh, the killer app, right, uh, of of this this entire, um, including 5G and uh, co-presence and whatever people are calling metaverse now or whatever. But but to me, it's just this uh, very simple thing: a shared reality, because public service is impossible to to do without understanding the situation people are in. But not everyone is well versed in writing, you know, documents and PowerPoint presentations. So for people who uh, are suffering, for example, in Hangchun because of lack of ambulance and things like that, we actually needed to go there and share in their reality to actually take that car ride and so on to understand the deeper configuration. Uh, and so the pandemic now uh, prompted that instead of people just staying in their own offices, people can go outdoors. And thanks to low latency 5G and soon lower orbits and other communication technologies, people can bring the ambience to the other side of the planet, the other side of the countries and so on, and start to share in the same reality. So instead of thinking it as virtual reality, which sounds rather solo, uh, I always think it in terms of shared realities and co-presence. Mm. Okay, thank you. And another question is uh, the, similar to the question I asked before. Uh, can the social innovation idea be brought into or applied in a conventional mm -hmm. industry for mm -hmm. its digital transformation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. such as the construction industry? Mm -hmm. If it's possible, what suggestions of how to do it or how to initiate it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so one of the social enterprises uh, that I worked with um, uh, is a BIM, right, a, a um, information modeling um, company. Uh, it, they deliver pretty good services uh, to, to do simulations and modelings and managing common assets and so on. Uh, and unbeknownst to many of its customers initially, uh, they work uh, with people with uh, different abilities. That is to say, people who would have difficulty going to, to uh, the, the, the streets and so on, the people who uh, are severely paralyzed and, and people who are suffering from other uh, conditions. Uh, so through a set of very innovative um, redesign of the basic working process of their software and hardware kits uh, and working with uh, professional social helpers and workers and so on. Uh, they transformed how the BIM uh, uh, workflow process can be done in a purely virtual way. So it's like a, a pilot because we're now all suffering somewhat uh, <laughs> thanks to the pandemic, uh, similar to their situation, but they, they were a leader uh, in making such workplace uh, innovations. And so it not only uh, of course, uh, delivered uh, value and also dignity uh, for people with different abilities. But it's also a social innovation that any social worker and also people with different abilities may join at any given time, while, of course, creating more value to the society. 
Okay, thank you. And then there's a, que uh, I, the, a question from India. Uh, thanks for the inf informative uh, webinar and thanks to the speaker, Audrey. Uh, my question is, how can you relate the role of civil engineers in tackling the pandemic? Mm -hmm. How can the well, young generation frame? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, start with mm -hmm. that. Well, I always think of uh, civil engineers as makers of public infrastructure. That is to say, um, places where everyone can uh, work and um, educate and collaborate uh, in a pro-social fashion, right? So, uh, and one of the key element of a public infrastructure is that it's, it's open to all. It's for everyone to use. And indeed that's the civil in civil engineering. Otherwise it's just private sector <laughs> engineering. Uh, and so um, I often think of the places uh, both offline, like the social innovation lab, my office, uh, which is shaped like a park and anyone can just walk in, there's no walls and so on. Now also the, the digital space like PTT, or the joint petition platform or a presidential hackathon as the digital equivalent to public infrastructure. So I often call it digital public infrastructures. That is to say, um, in Taiwan, uh, a few years ago in 2016, we convinced the National uh, Budgeting Office and Audit Office that investment to public infrastructure in the digital world also qualifies as civil engineering and can use the special budget for, for civil engineering. And, and that says um, a, a lot about how we're now collaborating in a way that are cyber physical. That is to say, uh, any civil engineering projects has some part that can accept digital social innovation, sometimes through, for example, uh, we use drones to uh, and photogrammetry to scan uh, our public infrastructures and also our uh, movie sets and things like that into digital assets so that people can co-create uh, more cultural works or even video games um, online and then use that as a feedback to get more people's attention and engagement to then improve the public infrastructure or museums or the uh, local heritage sites and so on, uh, building a kind of popular uh, engagement via a uh, incremental cycle of more engagement people care more and also then more contribution the community also care more and then people from afar then care more and people in the community care more so instead of separating the cyber and the physical I now often uh, advocate to create the digital twins or doubles in the shared reality so that people who are not physically in that space can still participate meaningfully and then uh, will become committed to improve that space. So that's uh, the, the interaction become a very important element in the digital twin trend. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's definitely, yeah. So instead of uh, thinking about user experience, which is, you know, that the people you already know, like, right, they're already your users, we can think about the, the human experience, like the entire humanity and how they may discover and make use of the assets you're producing without necessarily being your user or customer. Mm. So that, that will also have a big impact to the human's development too. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we will move on to the last question. Uh, uh -huh. As capacity building become an important topic in our generation and future generation due to uh -huh. uh, less, less kids, et cetera, how do you think we can do this to, to, to reach this goal or maintain this capacity building or capacity sustainably based on digital expertise. Sorry, I, I didn't get a connection uh, between yeah. that. Uh, the ca capacity building become an important topic in our generation. Yeah, sure. in, are there enough engineers in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How would you think digitalization or digital innovation can help maintain a capacity? Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, I mean, logically, if we digitally connect to the global neighborhood, then we don't have to do most of the things ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, the wheels have been invented. The open innovations are within reach. We don't have to uh, redo things. Uh, we just uh, connect things together like Lego blocks and so on. So the, the capacity become the capacity to connect instead of just the capacity to make. And, and that is truly digital transformation. Because if we think of digital transformation as just going paperless, 
then of course uh, we still need to do whatever we're doing. And we actually probably have to do double the work because we still have uh, other stakeholders who prefer paper. But if we think of digital social innovation as a way to transform our work uh, so that anything that could be automated or has already been done somewhere else in the world uh, is just done that way and we just connect them together, then we just um, um, ameliorate a lot of the chores that we find in our ordinary uh, daily work. And then we can then dedicate more of our time on the more innovative pursuits. So instead of saying capacity building, I'm still uh, emphasizing on the idea of digital competence. Once we all become more digitally competent, then our capacity, the nature of our capacity changes. Wow, okay, thank you very much for your uh, inspiring uh, uh, talks and uh, ideas. Uh, we've, we take this opportunity to thank uh, Audrey Tan. Uh, one hour passed uh, very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we look forward in, uh, in uh, another chance to meet Audrey Tan again. Thank you thank very you. much for your time. Thank you. Live thank more you. and prosper. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Okay.